Today we will dive deep into how religious developments in England profoundly influenced the settlement of the New World, focusing specifically on the Puritans and Pilgrims. The religious upheavals of the 16th and 17th centuries reshaped English society and propelled waves of migration to America. These migrations were driven by a desire for religious freedom and the opportunity to establish communities rooted in specific religious convictions. This lecture will explore the complex wave of religious, social and political factors that fueled these migrations and their long-lasting impact on American society. The English Reformation began with King Henry VIII's break from the Roman Catholic Church in 1534, a move that had profound implications for England and its future colonies. In 1534, Henry VIII passed the Act of Supremacy, declaring himself the supreme head of the Church of England. This act effectively disconnected England's tie with the Pope and the Catholic Church, primarily motivated by Henry's desire to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. This break from Rome initiated a period of significant religious and political upheaval in England. Henry, uh, Henry's establishment of the Anglican Church was a pragmatic move to consolidate his power and secure his dynasty. The new church retained many Catholic practices, but it also introduced Protestant elements. This compromise created a state church that was neither fully Protestant nor fully Catholic, setting the stage for future religious conflicts. Under Edward VI, who reigned from 1547, to 1553, Protestantism gained a stronger foothold in England. Edward, influenced by his Protestant advisors, introduced significant religious reforms, including the Book of Common Prayer. These changes moved the Church of England farther away from Catholicism, emphasizing Protestant doctrines such as justification by faith alone and the supremacy of the scriptures. Mary the First Henry VIII's daughter by Catherine of Aragon sought to reverse the Reformation and restore Catholicism. Her reign from 1553 to 1558 was marked by the persecution of Protestants, earning her the nickname Bloody Mary. Mary's attempt to re-establish Catholicism led to the execution of hundreds of Protestants and the exile of many others intensifying the religious turmoil in England. Elizabeth I, who ascended to the throne in 1558, sought a middle ground with the Elizabethan settlement. This settlement established a moderately Protestant Church of England aimed at uniting the country and minimizing religious conflict. However, this compromise failed to satisfy more radical reformers leading to the rise of Puritanism. Elizabeth's reign marked a period of relative religious stability, but underlying tensions persisted. Now let's talk about the Puritans. Puritans were a group of devout Protestants who believed that the Church of England retained too many elements of Catholicism and sought to purify it. Puritanism was deeply influenced by Calvinist theology, which emphasized predestination, the sovereignty of God, and the need for a personal and direct relationship with God. They sought to eliminate what they saw as corrupt practices within the Church of England and to return to a more biblical form of worship. Puritans gained significant social and political influence in England, advocating for reform in church governance and worship. They pushed for simpler church services, the removal of hierarchical structures and greater moral discipline. Their influence extended to Parliament and other aspects of English society where they worked to enact laws reflecting their religious convictions. Under rulers like James I and Charles I, Puritans faced increasing persecution for their dissenting views. James I who reigned from 1603 to 1625 and Charles I who reigned from 1625 to 1649 were less tolerant of religious dissent. Puritans were fined, imprisoned, and sometimes executed for the refusal to conform to Anglican practices. This persecution intensified their desire to find a place where they could worship freely and live according 
to their religious beliefs. The quest for religious freedom led many Puritans to emigrate to the New World during the Great Migration of the 1630s. This migration saw thousands of Puritans leave England for the Massachusetts Bay Colony where they aimed to establish a city up on a hill, uh, a model Christian society based on their religious ideals. The pilgrims were a group of separatists who believed that the Church of England was beyond reform and chose to break away entirely. Unlike the Puritans, who sought to reform the Church of England from within, separatists believed in complete separation. They advocated for independent congregations free from hierarchical control and the interference of the state. This radical stance made them targets of persecution. Facing persecution in England, the pilgrims initially fled to Netherlands in 1608, seeking religious freedom. However, they found life in Netherlands challenging due to economic difficulties and cultural differences. Concerned about losing their English identity and the potential negative influence on their children, they decided to seek a new home in the New World. In 1620, the pilgrims set sail on the Mayflower, seeking a new life in America. Upon landing at Plymouth, the pilgrims drafted the Mayflower Compact, an agreement establishing a form of self-governance based on majority rule. This compact was significant as it laid the foundation for democratic principles in their new community. The Mayflower Compact is often cited as a pioneering document of American democracy, emphasizing the importance of self-governance and community consensus. So let's pause for a moment to consider this scene. Imagine being one of those pilgrims standing on the deck of the Mayflower as it rocked in the cold Atlantic waves. You have survived a 66 day voyage cramped into a small ship with over a hundred other people. Disease and fear are rampant but you are driven by a singular purpose to find a place where you can worship freely. As you step onto the shore you and your fellow settlers know that you need to establish a system of order and governance to ensure the survival of your fledging colony. The pilgrims' survival in Plymouth Colony was a testament to their resilience, adaptability and cooperation with Native Americans. Despite facing extreme hardships, their determination to build a new life rooted in their religious convictions enabled them to overcome obstacles and lay the groundwork for future generations. The pilgrims arrived in November 1620 just as winter was setting in. The cold, harsh climate and lack of adequate shelter made survival extremely difficult. The settlers were unprepared for the severe New England winter and their food supplies quickly dwindled. Disease and exposure took a heavy toll with nearly half of the original 102 passengers dying by the spring of 1621. Imagine the dire conditions. Families huddled together in makeshift shelters suffering from hunger cold and endless. This sense of loss and despair was pervasive, yet the community's faith and commitment to their mission kept them going. They buried their dead at night to conceal their diminishing numbers from potential Native American adversaries hoping to avoid further conflict. The construction of shelter was a critical priority. The pilgrims built a common house for meetings and religious services as well as individual homes for each family. These structures were simple and utilitarian, made from wood and thatch. The process of building homes was slow and labor-intensive, requiring teamwork and resourcefulness. The lack of food was a constant concern. The pilgrims brought some provisions with them, but these were quickly consumed. The barren landscape offered little in the way of immediate sustenance and the pilgrims lacked the knowledge and experience to cultivate the land effectively. The survival of Plymouth colony was significantly aided by the assistance of Native Americans, particularly the Wampanoag tribe and Squanto, a member of Pataxet tribe. Squanto's story is remarkable and highlights the complex interactions between Native Americans and European settlers. Having been captured by an 
English explorer taken to Europe and eventually returning to his homeland, Squanto had learned English and European agricultural practices. His knowledge and skills proved invaluable to the pilgrims. Squanto taught the pilgrims how to plant corn, beans and squash using fish as fertilizer, a technique crucial for the nutrient-poor soil of New England. He also showed them how to fish and gather shellfish, uh, significantly improving their food supply. His guidance and friendship were pivotal in helping the pilgrims adapt to their new environment. The pilgrims' relationship with the Wampanoag tribe, uh, led by Chief Masawit, was instrumental in their survival. This alliance was based on mutual benefit and cooperation. The Wampanoag were dealing with their own challenges, including diseases brought by earlier European contact, which had significantly reduced their population. Chief Masawit saw the advantage of forming an alliance with the pilgrims. In March 1621, they negotiated a peace treaty that established mutual protection and trade. The Wampanoag provided the pilgrims with food and knowledge of local resources, while the pilgrims offered tools, weapons, and support in conflicts with tribal tribes. The successful harvest of 1621, thanks to the guidance of Squanto and the support of Wampanoag, led to the celebration of the fast Thanksgiving. This three-day feast was attended by both pilgrims and Native Americans, symbolizing cooperation and gratitude. The event included a variety of foods such as uh, venison, fowl, fish, and harvested crops. The first Thanksgiving was not just a feast, but a, but, a, but, a, but a testament to pilgrims' perseverance and the critical role of Native American assistance in their survival. It represented a moment of shared humanity and mutual respect, despite the challenges that uh, lay ahead. The event commonly referred to as the Fast Thanksgiving, took place in autumn of 1621. After a successful harvest, the pilgrim held a three-day feast to celebrate and give thanks. This feast was attended by 53 surviving pilgrims and approximately 90 Wampanoag people, including Chief Masawit. The celebration inclu included feasting, games, and military exercise. So what was on the menu? The menu of the 1621 feast was quite different from traditional Thanksgiving dinner we know today. Historical records suggest that the meal likely included venison provided by Wampanoag who brought five deer to the feast. Fowl likely included wild turkey, ducks and geese hunted by the pilgrims. Seafood such as fish, eel and shellfish which were abundant in the region. Corn. Uh, that was uh, prepared in traditional Native American ways, possibly uh, as cornmeal or porridge. Native vegetables, including squaws, beans, and possibly pumpkins. Wild fruits, uh, such as berries and grapes. Now let's talk about the social structure and governance. Plymouth Colony was established by a group of English separatists known as the Pilgrims who sought to escape religious persecution in England. They arrived aboard the Mayflower and faced the immediate challenge of organizing a new society in a harsh environment. The Mayflower Compact, signed on November 11, 1620, was a crucial document that established a rudimentary form of self-government. This agreement was signed by 41 of the male passengers and was designed to create a social contract for the new colony. It emphasized the idea of majority rule and collective decision making. The compact was a pioneering document in the development of American democratic principles. It established a precedent for governance based on consent and communal responsibility which would influence future colonial and American democratic practices. Now we will discuss family life and gender role. Family life in Plymouth Colony was crucial for both its survival and development. Settlers arrived in family groups and their roles and responsibilities were distinctly outlined, forming the backbone of the colony's social structure. 
In Plymouth Colony, women were primarily tasked with managing the household. This encompassed cooking, sewing and caring for children, all of which were essential for daily life. Men, on the other hand, typically engaged in agriculture, construction and community leadership. They were often responsible for farming, building homes and taking part in local governments. The division of labor in Plymouth Colony was rooted in both practical needs and Puritan religious beliefs. Gender roles were clearly defined with men and women occupying distinct spheres of activity. This structure was practical, helping to organize daily life and ensure that essential tasks were completed efficiently. For instance, men's involvement in farming was crucial for the colony's food supply, while women's domestic work ensured that families were cared for and supported. Despite these defined roles, the harsh realities of colonial life sometimes necessitated flexibility. For example, during periods of food shortages or when additional labor was needed, women took on tasks traditionally reserved for men, such as working in the fields. This adaptability was essential for the colony's survival and demonstrated the settlers' resilience. Puritan beliefs heavily influenced gender roles in Plymouth Colony. The emphasis on modesty, piety and subservience shaped expectation for both men and women. Women were expected to adhere to these religious and social norms which included being submissive to their husbands and upholding Christian virtues. Sermons from Puritan ministers often highlighted the importance of women maintaining religious and moral standards within the household. While Puritan religious teachings reinforced traditional gender roles, the practical demands of colonial life often challenged these norms. Women's participation in farming and other economic activities, when necessary, reflects the pragmatic approach taken by the settlers. The ability to adjust roles based on need was key to overcoming the numerous challenges faced by the early colony. Religion was the cornerstone of life in Plymouth Colony. The pilgrims added to a strict form of Calvinism, emphasizing predestination and moral rectitude. Religious services were held frequently, with sermons often focusing on moral behavior and biblical teachings. The pilgrims built their church, the Plymouth Church, where services were conducted and community decisions were often discussed. The intense focus on religion shaped every aspect of colonial life from laws to social interactions. This religious fervor fostered a strong sense of community but also contributed to tensions and conflicts, particularly with those who did not share their beliefs. The pilgrims valued education primarily to enable reading the Bible, while formal schooling was limited, literacy was highly encouraged. In the absence of normal schools, parents took responsibility for educating their children at home. Notably, Plymouth Colony did not establish former, uh, formal education institutions until later, but the emphasis on Bible literacy led to high rates of reading and writing. The focus on literacy and religion uh, help maintain community cohesion and moral standards. This commitment laid a foundation for the high educational standards that would characterize New England in the future. Once the colony stabilized, the economy was based on agriculture, fishing and trade. These activities were essential for sustaining the population and promoting growth. The pilgrims cultivated crops such as corn, beans and squash which were essential for their diet. Fishing, especially cod fishing, became a major economic activity. They now developed trade relationship with other European uh, colonies exporting fish and furs. The diversification of the economy helped the colony achieve stability and growth. Agriculture and fishing provided the necessary resources for the settlers' survival and economic expansion, establishing Plymouth as a viable and productive colony. Trade was vital for the economic development of Plymouth Colony. The settlers engaged in trade with Native American tribes, which provided essential goods and facilitated economic growth. 
The pilgrims traded goods such as beaver pelts and fish with the uh, Wampanoag and other tribes. These trade relationships were beneficial for both parties, providing the settlers with necessary supplies and the Native Americans with European goods. Trade with Native Americans was a double-edged sword. While it provided economic benefits, it also laid the groundwork for future conflicts as the settlers expanded their territory and competition for resources increased. Now we will talk about the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was founded in the early 17th century by a group of Puritans seeking to escape religious persecution in England. Unlike the pilgrims of Plymouth Colony who were separatists, the Puritans were reformers who wanted to purify the Church of England from within. They sought to create a city upon a hill, a model of Christian piety and communal righteousness. The story of the Massachusetts Bay Colony begins in early 17th century amid a period of religious turmoil and political change in England. The colony was founded by a group of Puritans seeking to escape religious persecution and to create a new society based on their religious ideals. In 1629, the Puritans secured a royal charter to establish a colony in New England through the Massachusetts Bay Company. This company was more than just a commercial enterprise, it was a vehicle for religious and social reform. The charter granted the Massachusetts Bay Company considerable autonomy, allowing them to govern the colony independently from the English crown. This company's charter was unique in that it permitted the colonists to move to the new world with the company's governance structure intact, allowing them to establish a functioning government upon arrival. An important development in the establishment of the Massachusetts Bay Colony was the Cambridge Agreement, signed in August 1629. This agreement allowed the Massachusetts Bay Company to transfer its headquarters from England to New England, effectively bringing the entire company, including its governance structure, across the Atlantic. This move was crucial because it enabled the colonists to operate with a significant degree of autonomy from the English government. John Winthrop, a prominent Puritan lawyer and leader, was elected as the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Winthrop and other leaders envisioned a colony that would serve as a model of Puritan virtues and Christian governance. They believed that their success would demonstrate the righteousness of their cause and inspire reform in England. The English Civil War between 1642 and 1651, a conflict between the Royalists supporting King Charles I and the parliamentarians led by Oliver Cromwell, profoundly influenced the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The war provided an opportunity for the colony to exercise greater autonomy as England was preoccupied with its internal conflicts. The Puritans in Massachusetts were sympathetic to the parliamentary cause which aligned with their principles of self-governance and limited monarchy. This sympathy reinforced the colony's autonomous governance and commitment to democratic principles. During the Civil War, the General Court in Massachusetts operated with minimal interference from England, further entrenching the colony's sense of uh, independence. The colony's ability to govern itself without direct oversight from the crown laid the foundation for its later resistance to British control. The disruption of trade with England due to the war forced the colony to seek alternative trade partners fostering economic self-reliance. This period of adaptation highlighted the colony's economic potential and its capacity to thrive independently. The Navigation Act of 1651 was a law made by England to weaken the Dutch, who were dominating sea trade at that time. It required that anything coming into England or its colonies had to be transported on English ships or ships from the country where the goods were made. This was England's way of trying to control and benefit from trade involving its colonies. Imagine you own a small business in the American colonies and you want to import some fine Dutch cloth to sell in your store. 
before the navigation act you could just buy the cloth from a uh, Dutch ship that stopped at your local port but after the act you have to either wait for an English ship to bring the cloth or go through an English merchant possibly making the cloth more expensive and harder to get this law made it more difficult for you to do business directly with other countries and ensured that England could control and profit from the trade. When the monarchy was restored in 1660, England continued to enforce strict trade rules, which were initially put in place by the previous government. These rules became even stricter with new laws. Navigation Act of 1660 this law listed specific goods like tobacco, sugar, and cotton, which could only be sent to England or other English colonies. This meant that colonial producers had limited choices on where they could sell these valuable goods. The Staple Act of uh, 1663, this law required that any goods coming from Africa, Asia, or Europe uh, to the American colonies had to stop in England first. This allowed England to control and tax these goods before they reached the colonies. Plantation Duty Act of 1673, this law passed taxes uh, on goods traded between uh, different colonies. The goal was to cut down on illegal trading and make sure England got its share of the profits. Suppose you are a tobacco farmer in Virginia in 1660s. Under the Navigation Act of 1660 that we discussed, you can only sell your tobacco to England or another English colony, even if a Dutch trader offers you a better price. If you are importing goods like spices from Asia, the Staple Act of 1663 means those goods have to go through England fast, where they will be taxed, making them more expensive by the time they reach you. If you want to trade some of your tobacco with a neighboring colony, the Plantation Duty Act of 1673 imposes a tax, making your product less competitive and reducing your profit. These laws ensured that England benefited from all the trade involving its colonies even at your expense. The Navigation Acts had profound effects on the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Economically, these laws restricted the colony's ability to trade freely with other nations, leading to higher prices and reduced profits for colonial merchants. The acts also sparred widespread smuggling as merchants sought to evade the restrictions and maximize their profit. Smuggling became an entrenched part of the colonial economy, reflecting the deep-seated resistance to the British imposed trade regulations. Politically, the Navigation Acts contributed to growing resentment against British authority. Many colonists viewed these acts as an infringement on their economic freedom and political rights. The enforcement of the acts often involved corrupt and overjealous customs officials, exacerbating tensions and fostering a sense of injustice among the colonists. The enforcement of Navigation Acts was carried out through vice admiralty courts which operated without juries and had extensive power to adjudicate cases of smuggling and trade violations. These courts were deeply unpopular among colonists who saw them as a violation of their rights as Englishmen and a symbol of oppressive governance. The Navigation Acts played a crucial role in shaping the relationship between the colon colonies and England. The economic burdens imposed by these acts and the British government's efforts to enforce them contributed to a growing desire for economic independence among the colonies. The acts highlighted the colonies' economic potential and their ability to thrive independently of English control. The resistance to the Navigation Acts and similar measures laid the ideological and political foundations for the American Revolution. The acts fostered a sense of unity among the colonies and a shared commitment to defending their rights against perceived British tyranny. This sense of identity and autonomy was instrumental in the lead up to the American Revolution.
The governance of the Massachusetts Bay Colony was characterized by its Puritan values and its relatively democratic principles within the context of its time. The General Court was the primary governing body of the colony, composed of all free men who had the right to vote. This assembly was responsible for creating laws, managing colony finances, and addressing various issues affecting the settlement. The governor, elected annually by the free men, was responsible for overseeing the administration of the colony and representing it in dealings with the English crown and other colonies. John Winthrop, the first governor, played a crucial role in shaping the colony's early governance and policies. Each town in the colony had its own system of local governance with town meetings where residents could discuss and make decisions on local matters. This system of local governance allowed for community involvement and representation. In the Massachusetts Bay Colony, church and state were closely intertwined. Only male church members could vote and hold office, and the colony's laws were heavily influenced by Puritan religious beliefs. This close relationship between church and state reflected the Puritans' vision of a society governed by their religious principles. The Puritans placed a high value on education, believing that everyone should be able to read the Bible. This emphasis on literacy had a profound impact on the colony. The Massachusetts Bay Colony established some of the first schools in America. In 1635, the Boston Latin School was founded, and in 1636, Harvard College, now Harvard University, was established to train ministers. These institutions were critical in promoting literacy and higher education. Now we are going to explore a significant piece of legislation from colonial Massachusetts known as the Old Deluder Satan Act of 1647. This act represents one of the earliest efforts to establish public education in America and reveals much about the values and priorities of the Puritan settlers. The Old Deluder Satan Act was passed by the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1647. The title might sound unusual to modern years, but it reflects the Puritans' deep commitment to religious education. The act aimed to ensure that every child in the colony would have the ability to read and understand the Bible. The name, Old Deluder Satan, captures the Puritan belief that ignorance was a tool of the devil used to lead people away from God. The primary goal of the Old Deluder Satan Act was to combat ignorance and promote literacy among the colonists. The Puritans believed that a well-informed populace was essential for both religious and civic life. By ensuring that children could read the Bible, the act sought to uphold the moral and spiritual integrity of the community. The act had specific requirements for towns based on their size. Towns with 50 or more households, these towns were required to appoint a teacher. The teacher's role was to ensure that children could read and write, thus achieving the basic educational goal of the act towns with 100 or more households, these larger towns had a more rigorous requirement. They were mandated to establish a grammar school. The purpose of the grammar school was not only to teach reading and writing but also to provide a more advanced education that would prepare students for higher education and leadership roles in the community. This focus on education helped create a society that valued knowledge and learning. Literacy rates in New England were higher than in many other parts of the world at that time, and this emphasis on education would have long-term benefits for the development of American society. Religion was the central pillar of life in Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Puritans' daily routine and social structures were heavily influenced by their religious beliefs. Attending church was not only a religious duty but also a social obligation. The Sabbath was strictly observed and Failing to attend church could result in fines or other punishments. Sermons, often lasting several hours, were the main feature of the service and focused on moral and spiritual instruction. The Puritan church was a congregationalist one, meaning each congregation governed itself independently. 
This structure allowed for a close-knit community where members were deeply involved in church affairs. Aside from religious services, the community engaged in various events that reinforced social bonds. Town meetings were a crucial aspect of civic life where male property owners could vote on local issues and policies. These meetings fostered a sense of communal responsibility and participation. Now we will discuss the religious conflict in Massachusetts Bay. The Puritans who founded the colony sought to escape the religious persecution they faced in England. However, they were not looking for religious diversity. Instead, they aimed to establish a community that strictly adhered to the interpretation of Christianity. The Puritans were reformers within the Church of England dissatisfied with what they saw as lingering Catholic practices and a lack of true freedom. Their goal was to create a city upon a hill, a model society based on their religious ideals. Roger Williams was a significant figure in the early history of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and a staunch advocate of religious freedom. Williams arrived in Boston in 1631 and quickly became known for his radical views. Roger Williams was born in London in 1603 and was educated at Cambridge University. He was a Puritan minister who believed in the separation of church and state, a radical idea at that time. Williams argued that civil government should have no authority over religious matters, a belief that put him at odds with the leaders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Williams' views on religious freedom and the separation of church and state led to several conflicts with the colony's authorities. He also criticized the Puritans for not fully separating from the Church of England and for their treatment of Native Americans. He believed that the colonists should purchase land from the Native, uh, Native Americans rather than simply taking it. In 1635, Williams was tried and convicted of spreading new and dangerous opinions. Facing banishment, he fled the colony and eventually founded uh, Providence in what is now Rhode Island. There he established a new colony based on principles of religious freedom and separation of church and state. Rhode Island became a refuge for those seeking religious tolerance. Similarly, Anne Hutchinson was born uh, Anne Marbury in Alford, England in 1591. She was the daughter of Francis Marbury, a deacon and school teacher who faced persecution for criticizing the Church of England. Anne's early exposure to religious dissent likely influenced her later beliefs and actions. In 1612, Anne married William Hutchinson, a successful merchant. The couple, drawn by the Puritan movement, followed the sermons of John Cotton, a prominent Puritan minister. When Cotton immigrated to the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1633, the Hutchinsons decided to follow him the next year, seeking religious freedom and a place to practice their faith more openly. Upon arriving in Boston, Anne Hutchinson quickly became a respected member of the community. She began hosting meetings in her home where she and other women would discuss the weekly sermons. The meetings soon grew and uh, their influence also increased, attracting both women and men, including some of the colony's leading figures. Hutchinson's teachings centered around the idea of the uh, covenant of grace, which posited that salvation came through God's grace alone, rather than through good works or adherence to religious laws. This view challenged the Puritan emphasis on covenant of works which held that moral behavior and adherence to church's teachings were essential for salvation. Anne Hutchinson's views sparked what is known as the antinomian controversy. The term antinomian means against the law. Anne Hutchinson's critics accused her of promoting lawlessness by suggesting that the elect were not bound by moral law. Hutchinson's meetings and her outspoken criticism of the colony's ministers created deep divisions within the community. She argued that many ministers preached that good deeds were needed for salvation, leading people away from true faith. 
Her views gained a significant following which alarmed the colony's leaders, including Governor John Winter. In 1637, Anne Hutchinson was brought to trial before the General Court of Massachusetts charged with heresy and sedition. The trial was a significant event as it highlighted the tensions between individual religious expression and communal conformity. Hutchinson defended herself with eloquence and intelligence, but her claims of receiving direct revelations from God ultimately led to her downfall. This assertion was seen as a direct threat to the colony's religious and social order. Governor Winthrop and other religious leaders accused Hutchinson of undermining the colony's ministers and promoting discord. Despite her articulate defense, Hutchinson was found guilty and banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. In 1638, she, along with many of her followers, relocated to Rhode Island, a colony known for its religious tolerance, which had been founded by another dissenter, Roger Williams. The internal religious conflicts in the Massachusetts Bay Colony had significant and lasting impacts. The case of Anne Hutchinson and of Roger Williams challenged the strict religious orthodoxy of the Puritan leaders. These conflicts highlighted the difficulty of maintaining a unified religious community in the face of diverse beliefs and practices. The banishment of dissenters like uh, Hutchinson and Williams underscored the limitations of religious freedom in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. However, their subsequent actions in founding Rhode Island helped lay the groundwork for the broader acceptance of religious diversity in America. The experiences of Hutchinson and Williams demonstrated the importance of religious tolerance and the dangers of rigid orthodoxy. Their legacies contributed to the evolving American values of freedom, of conscience and the separation of church and state.